you begin an investigation based on what? Your imagination. It was obviously a suicide. Never trust the obvious. Uncle didn't kill himself. Before a lifetime of adventure came the adventure of a lifetime. What's your name? Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. You are the police? My name is Sherlock Holmes. My name is Sherlock Holmes. Good evening, Lord Carfax. And what may I ask? Do you think of that, Mr. Holmes? Sherlock Holmes. The best and wisest man whom I've ever known. How do you do? I'm your host, Christopher Lee. Now, we shall have a look at this man among men, as impersonated by dozens of actors in hundreds of plays, films, and broadcasts. We shall meet his creator, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and we shall see the land which they knew and loved. You are cordially invited to join us as we examine the many faces of Sherlock Holmes. Thousands of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts flock to London to see the locations where fiction's greatest detective pursued his vocation. The Sherlock Holmes Hotel, an excellent starting place for a tour of Sherlock Holmes London. When you finally make your way to 221 Baker Street, don't be surprised if you find a bank. But rest assured, the legend of Holmes still lives on. In fact, the bank has a full-time employee who does nothing but answer the great detective's mail. Well, I do hope you've given uh, the woman a soul. She had one, you know. By the woman, I suppose you mean Irene Adler. Yes. For Sherlock Holmes, Irene Adler was the woman, the only person who ever bested him. She lived in a fictitious house on a fictitious street in this very real and exclusive neighborhood, St. John's Wood. Scotland Yard, headquarters of Inspector Lestrade the detective who so frequently took all the credit for Holmes's brilliant work. Where is Lestrade? Well, I imagine at the moment he's pretty well occupied. Just a minute, MacDonald. Get over there, all of you. You're under arrest. Now, put up your hands. The River Thames. Scene of a spectacular chase in The Sign of Four. Before the maniacal South Sea Islander Tonga could use his deadly blowpipe, Holmes shot him dead. His bones lie at the bottom of the river. Eerie Loch Ness in Scotland. Only in the movies did Sherlock Holmes encounter the Loch Ness Monster, which turned out to be an ingenious submarine. Whitechapel, one of the most notorious areas of Victorian London. 
In these blood-stained back streets, Sherlock Holmes of the movies, twice defeated, the most dreaded criminal of his time, Jack the Ripper. right back with the many faces of Sherlock Holmes. Occasionally to read detective stories. It always annoyed me how in the old fashioned detective story the detective always seemed to get at his results, either by some sort of lucky chance or a fluke, or else it was quite unexplained how he got there. He got there, but he never gave an explanation how. Well, that didn't seem to me quite playing the game. It seemed to me that he's bound to give his reasons why he came to his conclusions. Well, once I began to think about this, I began to think of turning scientific methods, as it were, onto the work of detection. And I used, as a student, uh, to have an old professor, his name was Bell, who was extraordinarily quick at deductive work. Arthur Conan Doyle was only 17 years of age when he first encountered Dr. Joseph Bell at Edinburgh University. Eleven years later, the master of the scientific method was transformed into the world's first amateur consulting detective in the first Sherlock Holmes story, A Study in Scout. Three years passed before Conan Doyle was persuaded to return to the detective he had once considered calling Sherinford Holmes. This time, it was an American on the staff of Lippincott's magazine who commissioned a new novel for simultaneous publication in England and America, The Sign of Four. Again, Conan Doyle thought he was finished with Sherlock Holmes, but the following year, George Newnes, editor of the brand new magazine, The Strand, published a series of Holmes stories, starting with the seventh issue, July 1891. Again. Conan Doyle foolishly wiped his hands after the 12 were in print. The public and the publishers, however, would not let go. Against every personal desire except the one for money, he obtained a lucrative contract for 11 more stories and then drew his own plans against the life of Sherlock Holmes. In the final problem, the last in the series, he introduced an arch criminal, Professor Moriarty who, in his only appearance in a home story, did the unthinkable. He killed Sherlock Holmes. The two, locked in a death struggle, tumbled into the Reichenbach Falls in Switzerland, never to be seen again, Conan Doyle fervently prayed. No such luck. The die had been cast and had landed a winner of such proportions that its very creator remained baffled for the rest of his life. Even as Holmes and Moriarty battled above the cataracts, matters were being taken out of Arthur Conan Doyle's hands. For that very year, 1893, saw Sherlock Holmes appear before the public in the flesh for the first time. Charles Brookfield became the very first portrayal of Sherlock Holmes in a musical review at London's Royal Court Theatre under the clock at Holmes singing and dancing with Dr. Watson. 
but it was not until 1899 that Holmes came into his own as a dramatic entity. A Connecticut Yankee named William Gillette wrote an original drama in which he starred on Broadway to resounding success. Gillette portrayed Holmes on stage, screen and radio for the next 36 years. In England, H.A. Saintsbury enjoyed extraordinary success with Gillette's play, touring the country for 20 years, taking time off to make one film as Holmes. Among the minor players in Saintsbury's 1903 tour was a boy who played two parts. It was Charlie Chaplin, later to become one of the greatest of all screen performers. Thomas Edison produced the first film of The Great Detective in 1900. The name of the actor who played in Sherlock Holmes' Baffled is lost to history, but the film itself exists, the first of over 100 silent productions from six countries. Universal produced A Study in Scarlet in 1914, starring director John Ford's brother, Francis. William Gillette brought his famous stage play to the screen in 1916. Despite his 63 years, his performance gained critical acclaim and reaffirmed his virtual ownership of the character. The screen's most prolific Holmes was Ellie Norwood, who appeared in a staggering total of 47 films in three years. Conan Doyle admired Gillette and Norwood above all others in the role. Samuel Goldwyn filmed the Gillette play in 1922 with John Barrymore as Holmes and Roland Young in his pre-Topper days as Watson. All the while, Conan Doyle himself was writing the last of the Holmes stories for the Strand magazine and seeing many of his other stories reach the screen, including his classic, The Lost World. And so, Sherlock Holmes and his reluctant creator were finally reconciled. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was not knighted for inventing Sherlock Holmes, but the world knew him for little else. Perhaps he finally welcomed his bastard son to his bosom after they had shared 60 published adventures. More likely, he enjoyed the financial rewards of his labors. Mankind has enjoyed the fruit. As Sherlock Holmes himself put it with characteristic modesty, I think I may go so far as to say, Watson, that I have not lived wholly in vain. The air of London is the sweeter for my presence. Please join us when we return to examine the most famous Holmes of them all, Basil Rathbun. Hello. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle died on July the 7th, 1930, at the age of 71. He left behind a legacy of literary romances, tireless public service, and a strange devotion to a major fad of his time, spiritualism. Doyle succeeded in converting Sir Edward Challenger to this mystical practice in one of his later novels, The Land of Mist. The old explorer of the lost world fell to his knees and cried with joy over his newfound faith. Fortunately for the history of literature, Sherlock Holmes was spared such public humiliation. The great consulting detective maintained his skepticism regarding the supernatural to the last, as he explained to Dr. Watson, the world is big enough for us. No ghosts need apply. If, however, his creator proved mortal, Holmes himself has shown an almost mystical resistance to the Reaper. In Doyle's lifetime, Holmes had appeared on screen over 100 times. 41 different plays had excited audiences round the world in a dozen languages and thousands of performances. In the 1930s, the advent of synchronized sound was to give Holmes a new dimension. 
The first Holmes to speak from the screen was Clive Brook, a former journalist and World War I hero. Brook's stiff upper lip carried him through two Hollywood features and one comedy short as Sherlock Holmes. Raymond Massey, best known as Abraham Lincoln on stage and screen, came from Toronto and, like Clive Brook, served in World War I. As an actor in England, he played many memorable roles in the 1930s, among them Sherlock Holmes in The Speckled Band. To English audiences, the definitive Holmes of the screen is Arthur Wompner, who played the part five times. Though in his late 50s, when he began in 1931, Wompner brought originality and humanity to his interpretation. Come in, my dear professor. May I point out, Mr. Holmes, that it is a very dangerous habit to finger a loaded revolver in the pocket of one's dressing gown? Just a slight precaution. Danger happens to be part of my trade, Professor. Danger? It isn't a question of danger, but of inevitable destruction. I arrest you, Robert Moriarty. On what charge? For being concerned in the murder of the stable boy, Edward Hunter. You must excuse me for trespassing on your private property. I've had the lift put in order again. You clever... No compliments, please. Listen, Holmes, there's no prison can hold me. No, I almost wish that were true, Professor. Life would be very dull without your activity. One Watson actually became a Holmes. Reginald Owen graduated from Clive Brooks' companion in 1932 to the detective himself in 1933. A study in Scarlet bears little resemblance to its parent novel. Holmes seems to have moved his lodgings across the hall in this film. His address was given as 221A Baker Street. A client, Watson. Well, the widow standing under the street lamp. A widow? Would you like to bet on that? Of course. Well, I'm not going down the street to ask her. Ah. Won't be necessary. She's made up her mind. So you deduce at a distance, eh? Not in this case. I recognized her features. She's a Mrs. Murphy. Her husband was murdered. Help! Murder! Help! Uh, help! Help! Holmes! 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 Are you all right? Quite all right. Thank you, Watson. Take them downstairs. The Hound of the Baskervilles had been filmed five times before Basil Rathbun first donned the Deerstalker in 1939. A popular screen villain, the 47-year-old native of Johannesburg, South Africa, had proved one of the screen's most able swordsmen. He had already been dispatched once by Leslie Howard and twice by Errol Flynn. As you can see, Rathbun was denied top billing by 20th Century Fox, a mistake not to be repeated by Fox or their successors at Universal. Rathbun's Watson was lovable, bumbling Nigel Bruce, who was three years younger than Rathbun, though he looked older. Their chemistry proved sheer magic, and it endured through 14 Holmes features and eight years of radio. I take it the new issue of the Strand magazine is out, containing another of your slightly lurid tales. Yes, indeed. And what do you call this one?
by the sewer, meaning you, my dear Holmes, will then be plunged 60 feet into the sewers below. Holmes! Ah! Holmes! Poor Moriarty. I neglected to warn him. It seems some careless person came across his trap door and left it open. Come along, Watson. Whoever's behind all this thing must be out of his mind. On the contrary, my dear fellow, if my assumptions are correct, this little scheme has behind it the most brilliant and ruthless intellect the world has ever known. You don't mean Professor Moriarty? I do. Oh, steady, Holmes, you've got him on the brain. This is the third time in as many months you've suspected him of unsolved crimes. He's dead, you know. Is he? Is he? No, he is. But I'll stake my reputation that Moriarty is alive and here, now in London. Oh, Professor Moriarty. Not that I wish to appear inquisitive, but to what am I indebted for the pleasure of this visit? Scotland Yard will be interested. As I get on in life, the little comforts appeal to me more and more. Oh, I beg your pardon. Won't you sit down? Thank you. And now, Professor Moriarty, what can I do for you? Everything that I have to say to you has already crossed your mind. My answer has no doubt cost yours. That's final. What do you think? I shall not rest until you are hanged for the finger murders. And now, Professor, our score is settled. Au revoir until I see you on the gallows. The rope has not been made that'll go around my neck. Come on. An evil man, Holmes, but what a horrible death. Better than he deserved. The many faces of Sherlock Holmes will return after these messages. Holmes. What? It's morning. Allow me to congratulate you on a brilliant bit of deduction. Now, up with him, Hamid. Plenty of fuel in the tank. Good. It would be too bad to have anything go wrong through so simple an oversight. I shouldn't do that if I were you, Colonel Kavanagh. I must congratulate you, Mr. Holmes. 
You're far more clever than I thought. Thank you, Mrs. Courtney. Praise from you is indeed gratifying. I shall always cherish the memory of your flattering words. Memory? Oh, thank you. And now I have a most regrettable task to perform. Holmes! You all right? Perfectly, thank you, old fellow, but I think this gentleman on the floor requires some medical attention. We will see that he looks his best, you know, when he's hanged. Upon commencement of production of The Hound of the Baskervilles in 1939, Basil Rathbun enthused, I think that Holmes is one of the greatest characters in fiction. To play such a role means as much to me as ten Hamlets. In later years, however, he looked back upon his sojourn at Baker Street with less enthusiasm. I don't know how Watson put up with Holmes all those years. I don't know how I did. The only mystery I couldn't solve was the same one Conan Doyle had, how to get rid of the man. As far as the world is concerned, neither of them ever will. detective relies on perception, intelligence, and imagination. Where'd you get that rubbish from? It's framed on the wall behind you. Here's a good trivia question for you. When did Sherlock Holmes make his television debut? Was it 1937, 1947, or 1957? The correct answer is 1937. Actor Louis Hector had played the part on NBC radio and became television's first Holmes when the network broadcast a full evening of experimental television in November 1937. Twelve years passed before Holmes reappeared on the small screen. This time in the person of Alan Napier, best known to television audiences as Batman's butler. John Longdon had appeared in four Alfred Hitchcock films and many others before starring in an ill-fated 35-minute television film of 1951. It was called The Man with the Twisted Lip, based on the Conan Doyle story of the same name. A matter of simple deduction, madam. Surely any woman whose husband has disappeared would go at once to his office and speak to his business associates in an endeavor to learn of his whereabouts. Since you have no such knowledge, it's obvious that you do not know where your husband's office is, nor do you know who his associates are. The only explanation is that your husband not only has failed to tell you of his affairs, but has moreover forbidden you to learn of them. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Not surprisingly, the next television Holmes was, that's right, Basil Rathbun. The screen's most famous Holmes was not done with the character yet. He not only made scattered appearances on television, but even tried to mount a stage production in 1953 written by his wife. Its failure on Broadway, coupled with the untimely death of Nigel Bruce, marked the end of an era and Rathbun's last appearance as Holmes. But Sherlock Holmes' television career was just getting started. I won't allow Holmes to investigate. A court order was issued this morning. A court order for what? The exhumation of Sir Charles's body. The autopsy has been completed. Sir Charles died from arsenic poisoning. In 1954, Actor Ronald Howard appeared in a series of 39 television films made in France. The son of screen immortal Leslie Howard, he was one of the youngest to play the part. No 
difficulty. Or was it? Well, according to my deductions, I should imagine that someone is at the door. Holmes! Holmes! What are you doing? Well, I hope I didn't alarm you, old chap, but I'm just taking gun prints. This is the end. The BBC has produced many Holmes adventures over the years, featuring such distinguished stars as Alan Wheatley, Douglas Wilmer, Peter Cushing, and Tom Baker. Other British-produced television shows have starred Ian Richardson and Jeremy Brett. Some would even find Holmes an object for humor. The same story which marked the debut of Basil Rathbun as Sherlock Holmes became the vehicle whereby a young Londoner made his first appearance in a film about the great detective some 20 years later. I did not play Sherlock Holmes in The Hound of the Baskervilles in 1959. Rather, I portrayed one of the title characters, and uh, not, not the hound. As Sir Henry Baskerville, I was menaced not only by the legendary phosphorescent canine, but also by a tarantula. Luckily, I was rescued by my good friend, Peter Cushing. He played the immortal Holmes in the first feature film about the sleuth to be shot in color. Sir Henry, keep perfectly still if you value your life. In 1962, a German film company offered me a chance to play Holmes myself in Sherlock Holmes and the Deadly Necklace. Thorley Walters played my Watson and later repeated the role briefly for Gene Wilder. Unfortunately, our voices were replaced on the soundtrack by those of other actors. Watson, for the last time. Here, on guard. All right, if you insist. show business. Eight years later, I accomplished something achieved by no other actor. I became the first Sherlock Holmes who went on to play his brother Mycroft in Billy Wilder's The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. This is my brother Sherlock, ma'am. Ah, yes. Sherlock Holmes. We have been following your exploits with great interest. Thank you, ma'am. In a moment, we shall see the triumphant return of Sherlock Holmes to the stage, plus his continuing career on screen and television, where he fought everything from criminals and psychiatrists to drug addiction and the British government itself. Don't go away. and you have placed me there. Now you must follow my instructions. And have the goodness to fetch Dr. Watson's revolver. Sherlock Holmes. Patriotic, courageous, tenacious, loyal, mind of a computer, and one of the most eccentric characters in fiction. In 1970, George C. Scott portrayed a man who thought he was Sherlock Holmes in They Might Be Giants. 
His Watson in this poignant comedy was the first woman to play the part, Joanne Woodward. Later, the film was remade for television with Larry Hagman of Dallas in The Return of the World's Greatest Detective. Another American production of Hound of the Baskervilles in 1972 starred Stuart Granger and featured Star Trek's William Shatner as the sinister Stapleton. Gene Wilder was Sherlock Holmes' smarter brother in a comedy send-up of 1975. Douglas Wilmer reprised his role as Sherlock with my Watson, Thorley Walters. Roger Moore, best known as James Bond, played Sherlock Holmes in New York in 1976. Patrick McNee played Dr. Watson, and the sinister Professor Moriarty was actor-director John Huston. In that same year, 1976, a most unusual Holmes film appeared. The 7% Solution had a drug-crazed Holmes in the person of Nicol Williamson, lured by Robert Duval as Dr. Watson to the clinic of Dr. Sigmund Freud, played by Alan Arkin. You may remove that ludicrous beard and kindly refrain from employing that ridiculous comic operator accent. I warn you, you'd best confess or it will go hard with you, Professor Moriarty. My name is Sigmund Freud. And it's no use. My feet are on the inexorable path to destruction. A man may sometimes retrace his steps. Not from the fiendish coils of drug addiction. No man can do it. I have. Make ourselves a target. Quickly! Hello! Oh! Oh, well done, Holmes. Bloody well done. William Gillette's play enjoyed a vigorous revival by the Royal Shakespeare Company in the 1970s with John Wood as Holmes. When the production moved to Los Angeles, Leonard Nimoy played the part. Charlton Heston starred in an original stage adaptation of The Sign of Four, titled The Crucifer of Blood. The biggest Christmas surprise of 1985 is Steven Spielberg's young Sherlock Holmes. Spielberg is today's hottest producer-director, and his film will undoubtedly be an event. Eta Holmes. Oh, I might have known. You dropped this! Nice! How oh, very nice! Egyptian! It's only a hallucination. Maybe not. Oh my god! I came to kill her! Stop! She's alive! As we approach the 100th anniversary of the first appearance of Sherlock Holmes, we may look back upon his enduring and lively career with some astonishment. What makes him as fascinating to citizens of the nuclear age as he was to readers at the turn of the century? Perhaps, despite all evidence to the contrary, we still seek order in our increasingly disordered universe. Perhaps it is the simple pleasure of watching a master craftsman ply his dangerous trade. As Dr. Watson observed, I had no keener pleasure than in following Sherlock Holmes in his professional investigations and in admiring the rapid deductions with which he unraveled the problems which were submitted to him. May Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street continue to give us all such keen pleasure for many years to come. 
We shall return shortly to share with you a few classic moments from the many faces of Sherlock Holmes. Since the start of this program, we have been in this recreation of Holmes' sitting room at the Sherlock Holmes public house near Trafalgar Square. Here, you can see mementos of dozens of cases, plus various articles which might have belonged to Holmes and Watson, but actually belonged to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and were inspirations to his writing. Sherlock Holmes described himself in simple terms. I'm a consulting detective, if you can understand what that is. Here in London, we have lots of government detectives and we have lots of private ones. When these fellows are at fault, they come to me and I manage to put them on the right scent. They lay all the evidence before me and I am generally able to set them straight. I cannot agree with those who rank modesty among the virtues. My mind is like a racing machine, tearing itself to pieces because it is not connected up with the work for which it was built. I cannot live without brain work. My life is spent in one long effort to escape the common places of existence. Let us take a final look at our distinguished list of players as they show us a few of the many faces of Sherlock Holmes. You're the new boy. Yes, I transferred from another school. My name's... Wait. Let me. Your name is James Watson. You're from the north of England. Your father is a doctor. You spend a considerable amount of leisure time writing and you have a particular fondness for custard tarts. Am I correct? My name isn't James, it's John. Oh, James, John, what's the difference? A great deal. Oh, very well, so your name is John. How did I do on the others? You were correct. On every count. But how's it done? Is it some sort of magic trick? No, <laughs> no magic, Watson. Pure and simple deduction. Hmm. He drew out his entire balance in cash, nearly 10,000 pounds. Yesterday, just after that young woman was murdered. What does that suggest to you, Watson? That he paid it out to someone. Precisely. I smell the faint, sweet odor of blackmail. You don't think he paid it out to someone who saw him murder the McLean woman? Sir George never murdered anyone. But he did have that woman's finger, and he empty did have a lot of, and pay out a lot of cash. That's the terrifying part about blackmail, Watson. The victim is afraid to fight the accusation, no matter how false. Once the accusation is made, the name is smeared, Sometimes his life is ruined. Well, Sir George didn't commit these murders. What fiend did? I rather think they're not the work of any one man. Oh, come, Holmes. You don't expect me to believe there's a whole organization going about killing people and, and chopping off their fingers. That's no, possible, quite possible. What, an, what are you doing? I'm trying to corner the last pea on my plate. Squash my pee. Ah, the game's afoot again. This hat is three years old. The flat brim curled at the edges came in then. It belongs, Watson, to a man who has suddenly gone down in the world. He's middle-aged, goes out little, and has grizzled hair which has been cut in the last few days. 